Walter Scott called Scotland stern and wild. Her sons knew that he spoke the truth. Their mother is beautiful, but she is as hard and fierce as necessity. And necessity, they say, is the mother of invention. The early Scotsmen had to use their wits and look ahead. In time, they found there was little to be gained from fighting and thieving, though they had practiced those arts for many a year. They could only hope to survive in a land like that by using ingenuity. The need for the gift brought the gift, and there is a Latin byword that tells you what happened. It speaks of the perfervid ingenuity of the Scot. Other things have been said of the Scot that are not so flattering. One of them was that the noblest prospect for a Scotsman was the high road to England. Well, to look at a high road is an inspiring thing, but it is even nobler to make one. It was a Scot who made the modern road. We use the name of John McAdam often without knowing it, and he is the first ingenious man whose work you will see. McAdam was born in Ayrshire in 1756. He laid down boulders, then layers of broken granite, and over the top he rolled a smooth, durable surface and soon netted his country with the first good coach roads seen since the time of the Romans. He has written his signature in a wide, sprawling hand in the macadamized road all over the earth. And perhaps the most ingenious of them all was James Watt. Here is a gateway at Glasgow University named after him. And this is the notebook in which he wrote the ideas that have changed our lives. He was the man who tamed for our use the steam engine. It was known long before what, that steam could generate power by forcing a piston along a cylinder. The hardest we had got was the engine devised by Newcomen of Dartmouth in 1663. It was worked by cooling steam in a cylinder and creating a vacuum. Watt kept the cylinder hot and used separate vessels for condensing the steam. He used the steam itself and not the atmospheric pressure to force the piston along. In short, he found the principles and machinery by which later men could send the locomotive roaring along the track at 80 miles an hour. By his invention, another noble prospect was opened up, another highway to the south. Two years before Macadam, and a few miles from his birthplace, William Murdoch was born. When his wealthy neighbor, young Mr. James Boswell, was on his way to London and his great discovery, and while his poor neighbor, the crofter's lad, Robert Burns, was reading everything he could lay his hands on, the boy Murdoch was stealing pieces of coal and finding out some of their remarkable properties. He crushed his little pieces of coal into the bowl of a clay pipe. He found that if he heated this bowl, a gas was given off at the mouthpiece. He lit this gas and found a light that put to shame the tallow dips of his father's cottage. Many years later, in 1792, he had set up the first gas lighting installation in the world. By 1803, he had found out how to store gas and they had begun to light up great cities. About this time, another unexpected thing happened. James Naismith of Edinburgh was thinking in terms of steel. He was the great hammer man. He forged his engines in his foundries and hammered them into shape with his mighty hammer. His huge ironworks at Bridgewater handled heavy metal as if it were macaroni. And ten years before the steam hammer, the work of Naismith had been made possible by J.B. Nielsen's improvement on the blast furnace. The blast furnace was an old story in 1829 when Nielsen put his ideas into practice at the Clyde Ironworks in Glasgow. 
modern casting may be said to date from him. But the most imaginative of the work of Zion was Thomas Telford, the son of a Dumfrieshire shepherd. He was born a year after Burns and was not a bad poet himself. He was first a hard boy, then an architect, then the greatest civil engineer and bridge builder of his time. He made the Gotha Canal in Sweden and the Caledonian Canal in Scotland and hundreds of roads and bridges. He was the first to use steel for bridge building. This little ruin is the birthplace of a very remarkable man indeed. It is the Torfichen Mill at Linlithgow where Henry Bell was born. In 1812, a curious looking ship astonished the dwellers on the banks of the Clyde. It was of 25 tons burden. It moved at seven knots an hour. It was driven by an engine of no fewer than three horsepower. It was called the Comet. It was built by a carpenter with a bent for engineering. He was this Scotsman, Bell, who had decided to do something about the sea. The men of Glasgow and its port laughed at the little comet, but they dug their river deeper. They saw dimly in the future the tremendous litter of monsters the tough little puffer would bring forth. The mind of the Greenwich joiner tuned in across the Atlantic with the mind of the American, Fulton, and between them they conquered the sea as another Bell and another American were later to conquer the air. Iron ships demanded a new compass, and it was from Glasgow that this compass came. It must be confessed that the inventor was not a Scotsman, but the great Lord Kelvin lived in Scotland all his life, and ingenuity is catching. Another friend of the shipmaster was Robert Stevenson. He built the Bell Rock Lighthouse and devised the intermittent and flashing lights and the mast lantern for light ships. He was the grandfather of Robert Louis Stevenson. This is the house in Edinburgh where Alexander Graham Bell was born in 1847. You may or may not be grateful, but it is thanks to Graham Bell that you can hear me now, for he was the first to transmit the human voice along an electric wire. He was the third of three generations of Bells who had studied the human voice. He recorded it on a phonograph. He picked it up with his machine and carried it first from one room to another and then over the world. We can now, as you see, talk solemn nonsense to the Antipodes and hear them reply. And in Edinburgh too lived James Young Simpson, professor of midwifery at the Edinburgh University, whose ideas met those of the American Guthrie and resulted in chloroform. This is the early apparatus used by him. It is hard to believe that thousands of righteous Victorians rose in their wrath at this. They said that God had ordained pain and that it was impious to make a patient unconscious of it. Simpson thought he knew as much about divine ordinances as the Victorians. He went ahead and many of us have cause to be grateful to his memory. From his early discovery has evolved the wonderful anesthetic apparatus of today. capital city of that strange, restless, inquiring country. Even today it numbers less than the population of London. It is still a hard land to live in. Edinburgh is a town of dour people, fine strong buildings and a terrible east wind. But it seems to be a good soil for inventive geniuses who have given their discoveries to mankind. If you go 
along Prince's Street and toward the Carlton Hill in Edinburgh, you will find the grand new building, St. Andrew's House, which they have built to house the government of Scotland. A raw place with hundreds of rooms in which men work continuously on the greatest and most difficult problem of all, how to govern the Scots.